Hi, I'm Jake. And if you've watched any of our other videos, you'll know that we're working on clothing guides for Viking style clothing, specifically from Hedeby Harbor. If you haven't, check out that playlist. Lots of great videos so far. Currently, I'm working on a tunic based on textile fragments from the Hedeby Harbor site, but Last weekend, it was an absolute blizzard where I live, and the past couple of days, we've had nothing but rain and sleet, so it's miserable out. Which got me thinking, now would be a great time to tackle the Hedeby Harbor Hood. And if you've seen any of our other videos, you already know that I will take just a moment to talk about the historical context and some controversy and discussion around the hood before we actually get into construction. So if you'd rather skip right to the construction, you can just jump ahead in the video to this time or stick with us and we'll get started in just a moment. So there's a few things that I do have to say about this hood from the Hedeby settlement. First of all, I don't actually believe that this fragment that we're talking about is in fact a hood. It's really, really small and its dimensions are sort of awkward. I don't really think that this would fit an adult's head and neck and shoulders very well. And you'll see just in a minute when we get onto the construction, what I mean by that and how we need to sort of modify that pattern a little bit to get it to fit us. Inge Haig basically came up with the idea that this fragment was a hood. However, since its publication, a number of people have come forth and said, it's probably not a hood, but rather a form of child's clothing, maybe a tunic, and maybe what we're looking at is a sleeve area, a lower part of the chest and side, and then maybe a gore that would extend down to the edge of this child's garment. One of the reasons why is up in the corner of the fragment, there's actually an area of stitching, an area that looks like it could be a keyhole neckline for a much smaller person. Given that there's stitching here, and it's only about seven inches wide, it would be far too narrow for this to actually be the body of a hood. Personally, I think these aspects can't really be overlooked, and in fact, this likely isn't a hood. However, the reason why I think we should consider this fragment when reconstructing hoods for the Viking Age is that our catalog of hoods in general is very narrow. We only have a few hoods to go off of, and one of them is the Schuldhammen hood from Norway. Personally, I think the Schuldhammen hood is also problematic. Its dating is towards the end of the Viking Age, and it's hard to tell if the person who was wearing this hood was Norse, Sami, or maybe influenced by both cultures. I do think that it is a valid hood to be used within the Viking reenactment community, but to be the most popular style of hood fashion, I simply don't agree with. It is important as reenactors that we use the evidence on hand. And until someone comes along and completely disproves that this textile fragment is not a hood or comes up with a different example of a hood, I think it's okay to be using this for now. So of course, you know that I'm gonna bring up the trusty Viking dress code by Kamal Rabiega. He mentions this hood fragment, and I wanna talk a little bit about the measurements that he gives specifically. He says, additionally, tailed hoods would be worn with triangular gussets at the shoulders. A find of this type comes from Hedeby and was discovered in 1937. The fragment is around 55 centimeters long and 20 centimeters wide. It consists of five parts and has a distinctive tail at the back. The lower part covering the shoulders was extended by the addition of gussets. Hoods of this type do not occur in archeological sources outside of Hedeby. However, picture stones from Gotland, Sweden depict figures wearing similar accessories. Like I mentioned, the archeological record for hoods in the Viking Age is really slim. However, we do have a lot of hoods that exist beyond the Viking Age and in some other Norse settlements in medieval Europe. For example, there are some Norse hoods from the Hurjalfsnes settlement in Greenland. Now, obviously this is a much later time period, but you can see their shape and design is quite familiar. In just a minute, we'll take a look at a drawing that I've come up with, which is basically an extrapolation of a current speculative schematic about how this fragment would have been part of a wider hood. You'll notice how I basically expand some parts, take away other parts, um, but essentially the measurements are the same for the original fragment. So hopefully we'll be able to keep that integrity in the final hood that we create. So now I've given you the facts and I've given you my personal opinion. Hopefully this is enough information to help you make your own decision on whether this belongs in Viking Age reenactment as a whole 
whether or not it's actually a hood, and whether or not it belongs in your Hedeby persona or your wider Danish persona. Now let's get started with the construction. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're working off of this fragment, which is in the Viking dress code by Kamal Rabiega. And what I've done is actually taken a drawing of this so that I can better understand how I'm going to make a pattern directly from this. The only problem that I have though is I don't know where this original conjectural schematic actually comes from. I don't know if it was developed by Inga Haig who cataloged this piece. I don't know if it's um, by someone at the Danish National Museum, which is where the current fragment sits. I don't know. I have no idea where it comes from, but I think it's actually quite problematic because if we were to use just this shape, we would never end up with a hood that actually fits an adult human. However, I do think that the original measurements can still be extrapolated into a different shape that would actually fit someone's head. So let's talk about those measurements. The first thing is, what was the circumference of the base? We don't really know. We don't even know what the base looked like. However, for me, I measured 60 inches around my shoulders. This is just enough so that it's comfortable for me to wear. It's not very restrictive, but it's snug and it's still warm. So what that will end up being is 30 inches on this side, and then there will be another panel just like this on the opposite side that it will get sewn to, which will complete our 60 inches. So we've got 30 inches here to play with. I think that this main body of the hood piece could be about 10 inches. Aside from the fact that there are some seam marks here, right at the very top, we don't really know how big this fragment was. So it's possible that it was quite a bit wider. So I've gone and made 10 inches as the size for the top, and I think that it's okay to have 10 inches down here at the bottom. However, I don't think that this ended just here with a 90 degree angle. I think it probably went forward quite a bit. If we look at designs for other early medieval hoods, this is much more in line with what we see and having something come down and be stopped this short would be super uncomfortable around the wearer's neck and chest. So I've added about five inches here, making this total body piece out front about 15 inches wide, coming up a little bit sharply and then going in a little bit more towards the neck. Because again, I don't know where this line comes from and to be honest, I don't think it's very accurate. Okay, so that takes 15 inches out of the question. Now we have another 15 inches to play with. This middle gore, I'm not really sure how big it was, but based on the directions and trajectory of the seams that we have here and down here, we could surmise that it's probably somewhere between five and seven and a half inches. That's just based on the scale of the actual fragment that I have seen. Therefore, this back fragment here could be anywhere between five and seven and a half inches as well. So that's what I've outlined here. I do think that this coming down as a completely rectangular panel is also probably not accurate. It probably kicked back up a little bit further, it was more triangular shaped, which gives a lot more volume around the shoulders and uh, gives us a better fit up towards the neck. And the last part, I do think that there needs to be some sort of opening here uh, that juts out to give us a better profile for the facial enclosure. And that's because if we look at other medieval hoods, we notice that this comes out quite a bit so that you can protect yourself from the weather or perhaps conceal your identity. And then if you want to have more visibility, you can actually roll back the hood onto your face uh, and get it out of the way a little bit easier. So what I've done is made this about 10 inches deep as well, uh, rather than scooping in so sharply. And I think it should be about 12 inches long before uh, it actually juts in here. So that takes care of uh, circumference question and the shape question. Uh, but now what about the length of the Lyra pipe? Again, this conjectural schematic is shown in the Danish National Museum, which I had the privilege of seeing in 2017. Uh, this is not my picture, but uh, you probably wouldn't want to see the pictures that I took. They did not come out very good. Uh, but anyway, this is what the fragment actually looks like in relation to that schematic. And I don't think that the Lyra pipe would have really been that short. I think it actually would have been quite long. Um, 
you know, for example, here is another schematic from the Danish National Museum. And if we are to believe that these figures are uh, some sort of hooded figures in a ceremonial procession, that this is the lira pipe of a hood, uh, or it could be hair, who really knows? But anyway, the original fragment shows that this would have been roughly seven inches long. Uh, and maybe about seven, seven and a half inches wide, which is actually very, very wide. So I think I'm gonna make it quite a bit longer, maybe about 18 inches so that it reaches down to about the shoulder, again, so that it matches with some other iconography from the time. But I don't wanna make it too long. We see this really, really long fashion show up in later medieval depictions. Um, you know, we see some people wearing lira pipes that go down and tuck into their belt or even perhaps uh, later on in the renaissance where hoods are worn up over the head and the lira pipe is sort of draped elegantly around the neck and the shoulders and etc so i don't want to make it too long but i definitely want to make it longer than just this sort of uh, spike on the back of the hood so that answers those questions the last part is the enclosure depth i think i already covered this i want this to be about 10 inches deep uh, and again about 12 inches long so those are the measurements that I started with. If you find that maybe you're a taller person or your shoulders are a bit broader, uh, obviously you can adjust these measurements for yourself, but I just wanted to start with these measurements because they are as close to the original as possible. And I think that is a really good starting point for us. So next up, what we'll do is get this drawn onto a large piece of stock paper so that we can make our patterns and then we'll cut it out of our fabric. I forgot to mention what materials you might need for this project. First, you'll need thread of your choosing, some needles for hand stitching, a decent pair of scissors, some cardboard or paper or heavy cardstock to create your patterns, and you'll need some fabric. I've chose this really nice plain weave wool. I like going to discount fabric stores and just finding something that I like and picking up a couple yards of it just in case I need it for a project like this one. The original fragment was also said to have been brown, so I think this will be a great choice. You can also line your hood with another fabric like a softer wool or a linen, but I'm choosing not to do that for this one because there's actually no evidence for that being done here for this hood. But if you'd like to, all you need to do is sew up another hood out of that second fabric turn it inside out and insert it into the body of your main hood and then sew them together so that the seams line up really nicely. Okay, back with this really weird angle here, but I just wanted to show you what these pieces looked like as they were cut out. Uh, so we've got, again, the main body of the hood shape here. This is the top part with the facial enclosure and then down towards uh, the neck and the chest. And then we've got our main uh, internal gores back here and then these large gores for the back of the head, back of the neck. We have the Lyra pipe, which I've already gone ahead and sewn because I wanted to see what it would look like turned inside out. Um, it's actually quite a bit shorter than I thought. Once I attach it, if I decide that I want it to be a little bit longer, I may cut out some other pieces and reattach it. But I think so far this looks pretty good um, and I'm gonna get constructing this and then we'll take a look at what the finished product looks like. So this really didn't take long at all. I would say maybe about an hour and a half tops took me to construct this hood. And I think if you probably got your patterns right, cut out your fabric in the morning, 
you could have this completely done by the early afternoon. So here it is. Let me put it on to show you. It's actually a really snug fit. You can see right around my neck, it fits great, which is actually lending to how this hood performs as an outerwear garment. I think that if you have a really big hood and you're allowing air to get down by the sides of your neck or the back of your neck, you're actually not allowing the hood to do its job. It's supposed to be form fitting and it's supposed to be right next to your skin to keep you warm and keep out that cold air. So I really think that this pattern and this style of hood is actually really good. You can see the Lyra pipe is long, but not really long like we see in the later medieval periods or in the Renaissance. And there's quite a bit of room to sink my head back into this hood rather than having it right out at the opening. But I could, if I'd prefer to have more visibility, roll this back a bit. I still have to uh, hem this facial enclosure and this edge right here. So we're gonna do that next and then we'll take a look at the finished product. And now we're finished. We've completed our Hedeby style hood. I think it came out great. I love the overall shape and fit. It's very snug and comfortable and keeps out all the cold air. And I also really like the color. I think it goes great with some of the other garments that we've already made so far. And not to mention, I think that when I wear it with the Hedeby pillbox style hat, it sort of makes me look like a medieval nun. Anyway, I'm glad you stuck with us for this project. I hope you had a good time hand sewing. It's a very simple and easy way to elevate your Danish or Hedeby style persona and give you something that'll keep you out of the cold. So if you're looking for something to make this winter, this is an excellent choice. I hope you're as excited as I am for the next one. We're making a tunic based on textile fragments from Hedeby. So stay tuned, that'll be coming out shortly. Well, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. If you found this information helpful, consider giving us a like or share with your medieval minded friends. You can also subscribe and make sure to turn on that notification bell so you get all the updates. If there's something you think we could have done better, or maybe there's a topic you'd like to see in another video, comment below. We always love hearing the feedback. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.